We started this lecture with a question, which is what is convective heat transfer and how does it scale with momentum heat transfer in a boundary layer? And so over the last two components of the lecture, we have learned a lot about what convective heat transfer is. And now we wanna get a sense of for this flat plate boundary layer scenario that we're looking at, what's the relationship gonna be between the momentum boundary layer that we already are familiar with and heat transfer in whatever form it occurs. So I'm gonna start off by drawing a momentum boundary layer just to refresh your memory. So here we've got Y, and X, we've got incoming flow uh, with U infinity. And then we've got this idea of a boundary layer delta. And that boundary layer is gonna have, you know, a flow profile inside of it where Within the boundary layer, we have U changing as a height over the plate. And at the bottom, we have U of zero is equal to zero from the no slip condition. And at delta, we have that U is at delta is gonna to equal to 0 0.99 times U infinity. And so this is a momentum boundary layer uh, because we've got this change in momentum as a function of height. What we're interested in is we add temperature gradients. We didn't have temperature gradients before. Here, everything's one temperature. Now we add temperature gradients. How are temperature gradients going to interact with the velocity gradients? So we can draw another boundary layer. So we've got fluid coming in. And now we'll say we've got U infinity. But not only do we have U infinity, we have T infinity. And we have u at zero equals zero, but we have t at zero equals t wall. So we have a different boundary condition here. And we're going to have here, I will claim, a boundary layer called dt, which is thermal boundary layer. And we don't know what it is yet. So let's explore. Uh, so kind of little top there. All right, so there's gonna be two kinds of thermal boundary layers that we can have. Uh, Let's call them one and two for now. So in the first case, let's draw a temperature axis on the x-axis and the y-axis on the y-axis. And let's imagine that we have T infinity, the incoming gas being much colder than T wall. And when that's the case, we're gonna get a boundary layer which looks a little bit like this. So at the wall, the fluid temperature is gonna to equal to the wall temperature. And at the, uh, at the thermal boundary layer, we're going to have dt, where those, uh, the fluid temperature is going to equal the incoming temperature t infinity. So here you can see t wall is greater than t infinity. So we've got a hot wall where, fluid, where heat transfer is going to go from the wall to the fluid. Um, the other scenario we have is t2 sorry, scenario two, I should say. So let's draw another graph. So we've got T, we've got Y. And here we're going to have a hot gas, T infinity, and a cold wall, T wall. And we'll have a temperature profile that looks like this. And so um, in this case, uh, we obviously have the opposite profile of temperature, but we still have this feature that at the wall, the temperature is going to be the wall temperature in the fluid. And as you go higher and higher and higher, you're going to have a temperature that approaches uh, T infinity. And so we'll say we've got some thermal boundary layer height up here. Now, these are opposite temperature profiles in some sense, in the terms of the direction. And so we're going to need to introduce a new concept in order to describe them uh, in a unified framework. And what in order to collapse these distinct temperature profiles onto a, uh, a single profile that we can use to discuss the thermal boundary layer, we're going to introduce a new parameter called theta, which is a non-dimensional temperature. So theta is a non-dimensional temperature. And we'll give it two different definitions. Um, in the first definition for the hot wall, we are going to say that um, theta equals to uh, T minus T infinity divided by T wall minus T infinity. 
uh, and that is going to apply if T wall is greater than T infinity. The second case is the cold wall. And predictably here, theta is going to equal T minus T wall divided by T infinity minus T wall. And that is going to be um, for T infinity greater than T wall. So actually, <clears throat> Yes, hot wall, cold wall. Um, in some sense, you might want to think of those with respect to hot gas, cold gas, hot wall, cold wall. Depends on what your focus is. But so we've got these two expressions. If you're doing this in Excel or MATLAB or some sort of a numerical program, you can also define theta more generally as T minus the minimum of T wall and T infinity divided by the absolute value of T wall minus T infinity. So that's sort of a general definition of this non-dimensional temperature. And then we can return to the boundary layer that we drew, and we can draw our analog to the velocity case for the thermal case. So here we've got a profile that's going to look like this. And this is going to be theta. And at the base, we have theta at 0 equals 0. And we have theta at delta t is equal to 0 0.99. And the result is a thermal boundary layer. So now what we would like to know is, what's the relationship between theta, uh, delta t, sorry, and uh, delta? Or what's the relationship between u and, uh, and uh, t? And there's going to be a very important number that tells us about this. And it's a, it's a fundamental material property, or it is a material property. Fundamental is going too far. But we're going to use a non-dimensional number. I'm going to introduce two of those to this lecture, both akin to the Reynolds number, uh, but different, with different purposes. So the first is called the Prandtl number. With, so PR is the Prandtl number. And what this... So we have the Prandtl number, which is going to equal um, momentum diffusivity uh, which is going to tell us how fast is that uh, momentum boundary layer going to grow divided by thermal diffusivity. Or how effective is conductive heat transfer in this medium? And uh, we can define this, so PR is going to be equal to uh, the kinematic viscosity divided by what's called the thermal diffusivity, alpha. And that is equal to mu over rho. Thermal diffusivity is equal to K, the value that we saw previously, divided by rho CP. Uh, so another way to state the same property is um, uh, mu CP over uh, K. So this is the Prandtl number. And this tells us how fast heat moves through a fluid versus how fast uh, momentum can be transferred by that fluid. And we can take a look at that boundary layer. If we redraw our boundary layer here, we've got a flat plate boundary layer, Y and X. Delta is our thermal boundary layer. Now, we'll have a couple different cases. In one case, we're going to get a thermal boundary layer delta T, which looks like this. And this is if the Prandtl number is much less than one. So that means that uh, thermal diffusivity is, so if we recall, thermal diffusivity, momentum diffusivity. So thermal diffusivity is overwhelming momentum diffusivity. When does that happen? Uh, often in liquid metals, so mercury, for instance, or very hot metals of many different varieties, so liquid metals. And in that case, the thermal boundary layer is going to grow much faster than delta. Uh, alternatively, we can have delta growing, delta T growing much slower than delta. And so that means that momentum. Uh, uh, bound, the momentum boundary layer, the effects of the, of the wall on velocity are moving very quickly through the fluid, but heat transfer is taking a while. It's not catching up very quickly. And so this is for PR uh, much greater than one. 
And that would be the case, for instance, for water. Uh, and then when those numbers are about the same, we're going to have a special case If delta and delta t are equal, we're going to have delta t when Prandtl equals one. When Prandtl is approximately one, which would be the case for gases like air, where the Prandtl number is about 0.7. So here you can see that for different types of materials, the coupling of heat transfer and fluid flow is going to come out differently. And we're going to get different thermal and momentum boundary layers that vary as a function of material properties, um, which is an important result that we're going to investigate further in the CFD portion of the class. Uh, a little bit of additional material that I think is useful is when we're talking about heat transfer, we want to quantify things using a non-dimensional number as well uh, in the convection case. And we use something called the Neusselt number. akin to Prandtl and Reynolds. And for the Neusselt number, we have the definition that is the ratio of convective heat transfer to conductive heat transfer. And we can, uh, we can come up with an expression from this for this number based on what we already know. So we know Q conduction uh, is going to be equal to K times some area over a length, for instance, length of a, a pipe or a wall, let's say. Um, so the area of the pipe over the length of the pipe times a temperature difference. Q convection is going to be equal to that heat transfer coefficient times the area uh, and then multiplied by delta T. And if we take the ratio of those, so we had new salt L in this case is going to be equal to uh, Q cond over Q cond, which is going to be equal to K A over L delta T divided by H A delta T. Uh, you'll notice that of course the delta T's and the A's are gonna cancel and we are left with um, uh, uh, K over, sorry, whoops, what am I saying? I did this backwards. So we have Q convection over Q conduction, and uh, that is going to be uh, HA, in the case of convection, we have HA delta T. Sub in the other formula, in the case of conduction, we have KA over L delta T. Now, of course, the uh, A's are gonna cancel the area. If we're dealing with the same area. We have the same temperature difference. So the effectiveness of conductive and convective heat transfer is ultimately going to be um, uh, equal to H times the length of that surface, the characteristic length divided by K. So I'll just state that succinctly here, nu L, or actually I'll state nu as a function of X because that L can be X. So nu, it's so a function of x equals to hx over k. So that's an important number that we can use to characterize heat transfer. It's a non-dimensional number. And so a lot of the uh, specific values of h, for instance, are gonna collapse. And we can use a single Neusselt number to describe a much wider range of heat transfer cases. So uh, what, would this be, for instance? What, what, what we do in engineering is we often have correlations for the Neusselt number. So for a given heat transfer scenario, we can say how the Neusselt number behaves, and then we can use that to compute H, which we can use to compute Q, which is what we want to know as engineers. If we have some limit for Q, or if we know what Q is, that we can deliver a certain heat flux, but we or a Q double prime or Q, can deliver a certain heat flux or a certain total power, how much is that gonna heat up our system? To do that, we need to know H, and Neusselt number is a tool to calculate H. So to show you what I mean, we have two, uh, two correlations for the, uh, for the Neusselt number that we're going to look at later. Uh, and these are for laminar and turbulent. So we have Neusselt X, lam, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.332 times Reynolds to the half 
times Prandtl to the one third. And we also have mu salt x turbulent, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.0296 times re to the four fifths uh, times Prandtl to the one third. Okay, so what was I talking about when I said that we can use these to calculate H? Let's look at the laminar case. And notice again that these are local values. So what we'll do with this is we'll integrate over that entire flat plate. But we know that nu salt x is equal to hx over k. And it's also equal to 0 0.332 times the Reynolds number to the half times Prandtl to the one third. So what we can do is we can solve for h. We can say that h is going to be equal to 0 0.332 k times one over x times the Reynolds number, which is gonna be u infinity x over nu to the half times Prandtl to the third. And what we wanna do, so this is h as a function of x. What we want is we want the average h over the whole plate so that we could calculate heat transfer to the plate. So h bar, L is going to be equal to one over L times the integral from zero to L of H of X. So let's let's write it like a function there. H of X, H of X dx. So we can take this expression and integrate it. So we can say H bar L is equal to pull out everything that's constant, 0 0.332 K parental to the third. Uh, all divided by L. And that is going to be multiplied by the integral from zero to L of U infinity. And now if we take X to the half and divide by X to the half, we're going to have U infinity over new X all to the half DX. Now what happens if you integrate X to the negative one half, you're going to add one, you know, divide, you'll get multiplied by two. So what we're going to have is this is equal to 0 0.332 k parental to the third over length times two, and the x comes up, right? Because it's still square root. It went from root negative a half to root positive a half. So I'll have two u infinity nu x, oops, sorry, ah, that's wrong. Two infinity, u infinity x over nu to the half from zero to L. And we can just write this out as a single expression. Obviously, we evaluated that at L and at zero, that's all going to zero. So we have that H bar L, the average heat transfer coefficient, it's going to be equal to two times 0 0.332 is going to be uh, uh, 0 0.664 times K over L times uh, re to the one half times Prandtl to the one third. So you can see here that we can take one of these expressions we can come up with an expression for the overall H for a flat plate, and then we could compute H, and we could also plug that into Q and get that uh, Q is gonna be equal to H L bar A delta T, where this is gonna be some suitable T wall minus T infinity reference. So that's in principle how you use these numbers. And the last thing I'll say about these correlations is that you'll notice again that we have uh, Reynolds number scaling by different values. So we have different constants and we have different scales or we have different exponents, I should say, on the Reynolds. So if you look at a turbulent boundary layer and a laminar boundary layer, you're gonna get different behaviors in terms of heat transfer. And what that looks like is that you will have a much faster growth in the turbulent case. So here we have laminar thermal BL, and we have a turbulent thermal boundary layer. And the growth of the turbulent boundary layer is much faster as before because you're mixing cold fluid or hot fluid, depending on the temperature difference. You're mixing fluid that's at the gas temperature close to the wall, and you're bringing temperature or gas or, or liquid that has been heated by the wall or cooled by the wall 
up to the free stream. And so if it's turbulent, you have a much more effective mixing process. And that mixing, that enhanced mixing leads to enhanced heat transfer. So in a lot of cases, if we want to maximize the amount of heat transfer we get, we try to make sure that we have a turbulent boundary layer. So just to summarize what we talked about here, the last part that we wanted to know uh, in this theory lecture with respect to convective heat transfer is how the presence of a temperature gradient is going to interact with the, the uh, momentum boundary layer. And what we saw is that we have different scenarios depending on the temperature difference, if the wall is hotter or colder than the fluid. And we can collapse those into a single scenario using a non-dimensional temperature theta. And, um, and if we use this concept of a Prandtl number, which is the ratio of how fast momentum diffuses in a fluid versus how fast temperature diffuses in a fluid or heat energy, uh, then we can come up with this relationship between the thermal and uh, momentum boundary layers as a function of the Prandtl number. And we notice that we have an increasing Prandtl number uh, <clears throat> will correspond to a smaller and smaller thermal boundary layer relative to the momentum boundary layer. Lastly, we looked at some at the Neusselt number. We looked at correlations for the Neusselt number, saw that we've got different behavior for a laminar and turbulent flow, as we've encountered several times in this course. And you saw how you could take that Neusselt number, you can take a correlation, get an average heat transfer coefficient, and then use that to calculate heat flux. So in the next, uh, in the next lecture, we're going to simulate one of these flows, and then we're going to use these concepts to analyze our results.